I said, okay, we're listening. Okay. Um, so I'm really excited that you came and joined us this evening. I've been thinking about this exhibition for several years, actually. Um, and um, it, it means a lot to me to be doing an art show that is about a topic that is so essential to our Canadian identity. I think that we all love and cherish our country. And um, I was able to find artists that, in a very, that are diverse in media, uh, diverse in approach at the topics that they're uh, taking on, and uh, diverse in age and cultural background. So um, I really am hoping that this exhibition is going to empower people with knowledge and is going to stimulate discourse around what's going on with our country. Um, we need to have good financial um, stability, but we also need to cherish um, the riches that are that define us as Canadians. So um, I want to introduce the artists that are here tonight. Uh, we have Ufu Gueri, uh, who's a painter who lives in Guelph right now. And this is Ufu's work here. Um, and um, we also have Vern Harrison's work that is photography, and there's Vern. Um, I'll just say, like, really quick, uh, Vern um, worked in Alberta in 1978 doing seismic uh, testing where they would locate oil and then they would sell the findings to companies like Suncor and so on. So this is a record of some of Vern's experience. And uh, we have Frankie James that's joining us from Toronto. Uh, Frankie does visual essays and um, the video that's coming up after Real Youth is hers. She has two videos on there. Um, and they're, the first video is from what year? 2011. 2011, so yeah. And then the, the second video is launching tonight. No one's seen it but us. And so we're really lucky she brought it in like it was still hot on the USB stick. It's still wet. Yeah, it got on. And, and she was uh, generous to let us have um, one of her Alice paintings. So Alice is going to be standing there as you're watching the videos. And uh, we also have the work of Real Youth, R-E-E-L Youth. Uh, they are a video collective that is uh, a nonprofit organization in BC and they focus on um, empowering young people to learn about video making, claymation, things like that, and getting their message across. And I'd like to invite the artists to say a couple words about their work. So I don't know who wants to go first. I'm not going to like pick one. I, 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 I'm not sure that I warned everyone that this is something that we do here. Yeah. But um, whoever's ready to go, and then of course, please feel free to uh, approach. Sure. 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 Mine is kind of pretty straightforward. Uh, I'm not a photographer, which is kind of interesting, but uh, back in uh, 1978 when I did go out to Alberta along with a lot of other Ontarians who were looking for uh, quick job and easy jobs and kind of fast money and sort of thing, and the promise was, you know, that if you went out to Alberta that there would be jobs waiting for you, and there was. Uh, by the time I got out there, I think I waited two or three days before I was um, employed to an oil exploration crew, essentially working in the Penman oil field, which is primarily between Calgary and Edmonton, and it is about 99% muskeg, which also meant that most of the work was done in the wintertime after the muskeg had frozen over, which also meant you were working in average temperatures of anywhere from 30 to 60 below. Um, so, really kind of rough and tumble work, we averaged 15 hours a day, seven days a week. There was no days off. And so uh, you started at like $3.25 an hour. And the way that you made your money was uh, by working so many hours, by the middle of the month, you were like on double overtime. So we averaged, say, for example, somewhere around 300 hours a month of, of work. Um, so. Uh, 
essentially I had a Kodak Instamatic camera with me, I had a 35mm camera, and I also, while I was out there, I found um, a, a knockoff called a Wizard that would actually use SX-70 film, because I refused to pay $200 for a Polaroid camera. $200 back in 1978 was a hell of a lot of cash, and I, I just didn't think that was right. But this wizard company from Japan made one that would take SX-70 film, and I think it cost like $29, so I was okay with that. So, and it was great because you could just kind of shoot all the time. I kept it underneath my coat to try and keep the film warm, um, and uh, just kind of shot um, photographs all day long, and as we're driving back in the truck at night back to our hotel, we kind of look over the day's images and stuff like that. And I carried around with me a little stamp kit, a little hand stamp kit. And the ones that I really liked, I would kind of put some sort of title to and, and a number to and, and kind of keep them. So I started with number one, and the next one I liked was number two. So um, there's a really interesting story about how these came about. Brian Helmer, image number eight. Um, the crew chief, one of the crew chiefs that, I, that was on the crew that I worked for was really good friends with Brian Helmer. His name was Steven. And about two years ago, so this is 30 years later, I, I get a phone call, it's a message from him, and he said, I hope this is the burn, I think it is, I've been trying to get a hold of you. Recently, my house burnt down and we lost everything. But the thing that we missed the most is you had done a drawing of our friend Brian Helmer from a photograph that you took of him. We lost that in the fire and we were like completely adrift without it because we recently lost Brian to alcoholism and um, a combination of alcoholism and diabetes. And he said, is there any possibility that you have, that you took a photograph of that drawing or that you have like, you know, some kind of documentation or maybe even the original image. And so he left his phone number, I called him back and I said, man, that's going way, way back, but I'll see what I can do. And I went down into my studio and kind of rubbing around and I found like this old beaten up black briefcase and opened it up and there was all the original images that I had taken in Alberta way back when. And like I say, they were just intended to be source images for drawings and paintings. So I found that. I also found the, I did had, had taken a photograph of the, of, of the drawing that I did, found that negative, sent um, a message saying, I have it, but I also have an idea, so you can't have it yet. And, uh, and this is uh, kind of what came out of that. So um, uh, I, I kind of like that, um, you know, we kind of, we were kind of sort of completely naive back in those days of kind of all the implications of what was going on and stuff like that. But I can tell you that for, ex for us, for example, an oil exploration crew, we were a freelance crew and we, um, we, which meant we were, weren't working for any one specific oil company. We were selling uh, the records that we took to any oil company that was interested in which meant we could sell the same records over and over and over again as long as somebody was, somebody, a company was interested in them. But I can tell you this to make you feel a little bit more at ease about kind of what was going on back then. Even back in 1978, the Alberta government had implemented a, a, a legislation, essentially, that anybody who used the cut lines through the bush for oil exploration, for seismic oil exploration, had to go back in the summer when all the, you know, everything had kind of, all the seismic work had cleaned up because they had to get out of there as, as the thaw started. So we had to do it all on foot, go back into the bush, and the cut lines had to be clean of any chopped down tr or uh, fallen trees, any garbage, and we were also issued a special uh, grassland mixture of indig indigenous grasses and plants where if our truck tires had torn up any piece of turf or area stuff like that, we receded and left things exactly as they were supposed to have been. And all that was, like I say, we were doing it by truck in the winter, but in the summertime, it was by foot and took, you know, the, essentially the entire summer to go over the lines that we had done all winter long and clean them up. So even back then, there was actually kind of thought about kind of the implications of what we were doing there. And it was an amazing experience, it really was. Um, you know, to be out in, uh, uh, in the bush, and because they were cut lines, the animals used those like highways. So we saw uh, bear, and moose, and deer, and otter, and ermine, and wolves, and fox, and, and uh, I remember sitting with my arm out the truck, my truck one day, and I'm looking out the window, and it's daylight, but there's an owl coming straight at me. And it's just coming down like this, and it looks like he's gonna fly 
right into my truck. And right before he gets to the door, the truck drops to the ground and like inches away from my face comes back up again and he's got a weasel in his talons and just takes off. Like, stuff like that, it, just, it was amazing. It was an amazing experience. So I, I, I love the images, I love them. You know, when I discovered them 30 years later, Polaroid kind of had weird colors to begin with, but they got even more weird and more beautiful. And then when you look really closely on them, they've also aged and cracked like old paintings. You can see little fissures and stuff all through them and things like that. And I just think now they're even kind of more compelling images and they even kind of uh, hold uh, how I remember those things happening even, even better. Thank That's you. it. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Like, yeah. And to me, it totally looks yeah. like 19.